Chapter 7 The Man on Putney Hill I spent that night in the inn that stands at the top of Putney Hill, sleeping in a bed for the first time since my flight to Leatherhead. I ransacked every room for food, but found only some biscuits and sandwiches in the bar. The sandwiches were too rotten, but I filled my pocket with the biscuits. I lay in bed in the dark, thinking. I considered the killing of the curate and retraced every step of our last conversation. It gave me no sensation of horror or remorse. I saw myself then as I see myself now, driven step by step towards that hasty blow, the creature of a sequence of accidents. We had been incapable of cooperation and I should have left him at Halliford but the reader must form his own judgment. With an effort, I set aside that picture of a prostate body to think of the fate of my wife, and suddenly that night became terrible. I found myself sitting up in bed, staring at the dark. I found myself praying that the heat ray might have suddenly and painlessly struck her out of being. The morning was bright and fine, The eastern sky glowed pink with little golden clouds. My movements were languid, my plans of the vaguest. I had an idea of going to Leatherhead, though I knew that there I had the poorest chance of finding my wife. Under cover of a thicket of trees and bushes, I walked to the edge of Wimbledon Common. There was no red weed to be seen. A cave and pond a busy swarm of little frogs in a swampy place among the trees. I stopped to look at them, but then had an odd feeling of being watched. Something was crouching in the bushes. I made a step towards it, and it rose up and became a man armed with a cutlass. I approached him slowly. He stood silent and motionless, regarding me. As I drew nearer, I perceived he was dressed in clothes as dusty and filthy as my own. His black hair fell over his eyes, and his face was dark and dirty and sunken. At first I did not recognise him. There was a red cut across the lower part of his face. Stop, he cried, when I was within ten yards of him. I stopped. His voice was hoarse. Where do you come from? He said. I come from Mortlake, I said. I was buried near the pit the Martians made about the cylinder. I worked my way out and escaped. There is no food about here, he said. This is my country. All this hill down to the river and back to Clapham and up to the edge of the common. There is only food for one. Which way are you going? I answered slowly. I don't know, I said. I have been buried in the ruins of a house 13 or 14 days. I don't know what has happened. He looked at me doubtfully, then started and looked with a changed expression. I've no wish to stop about here, said I. I think I shall go to Leatherhead, for my wife was there. He shot out a pointing finger. It is you, said he, the man from Woking. And you weren't killed at Weybridge? I recognised him at the same moment. You are the artillery man who came into my garden. We are the lucky ones, the artillery man said. Have you seen any Martians, I said. They've gone away across London, he said. I haven't seen them for... He counted on his fingers. Five days, the night before last, they had something up in the air. I believe they've built a flying machine and are learning to fly. Fly? That means it's all over with humanity, I said. If they can do that, they will simply go round the world. He nodded. They will. But, he looked at me. You do understand that we're beat. I stared. 
strange as it may seem, I still held a vague hope. He repeated his words. We're beat. They carried absolute conviction. I gave no answer. I sat, staring before me. What are you going to do? I said presently. What plans have you made? The artilleryman looked at me for a moment. I've been thinking about the drains, he said. Under London, there are miles and miles, hundreds of miles. I have started digging already. Later, we crept out of the bushes. After scanning the sky for Martians, we hurried to the house on Putney Hill. He had made his lair in the coal cellar of the place. I saw the work he had spent a week upon. It was a burrow, scarcely ten yards long. It was then I had my first inkling of the gulf between his dreams and his powers. Such a hole I could have dug in a day. But I believed in him sufficiently to work with him all morning until past midday at his digging. Then the artilleryman stopped digging and looked at me. We're working well, he said. He put down his spade. Let's knock off for a bit, he said. But we need to dig this tunnel, I said. We've no time to waste. After a little hesitation, he resumed his spade. Suddenly I was struck by a thought. Why were you walking about the common, I said, instead of being here? Take in the air, he said. I was coming back. It's safer by night. But the work? Oh, one can always work, he said. The artilleryman talked about capturing a fighting machine. I almost believed in him again. But now I was beginning to understand that this would come to nothing. It was all talk. There's some champagne in the cellar, he said. We can dig better without it, said I. No, said he, champagne. We've a heavy enough task before us. Let us take a rest and gather strength while we may. I realised that the artilleryman had no serious plan. I resolved to leave this strange, undisciplined dreamer of great things to his drink and gluttony. I needed to go on into London. There it seemed to me I had the best chance of learning what the Martians and my fellow men were doing.